Good morning. Please be seated and welcome to Mayflower Congregational United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Will you pray with me? First of all, Holy One, we really didn't think we'd make it to 2020, that is. We've survived some real dumpster fires, like 1972 to 1974, most of 97, and we shall not speak of 2016. Second of all, it doesn't look like how any of us imagined we acknowledge that it wasn't you who promised us flying cars or zero gravity boots, but we would like to know who we should talk to about the holdup. And third of all, and we're really not sure how many points we have, but third of all, we're a bit overwhelmed with everything going on right now, big and small, although there is really nothing that's small when it's happening. The hot water tank has a leak the merry-go-round of lessons, practice, games for the kiddos. Australia is burning, burning. Assassinations, rumors of war, actual war, the new diagnosis, remission, recurrence, elections, debates, the tension that chokes all conversation during dinner, the next deadline, there is always the next deadline. But before we go too far down that road, let us take a breath. Let us pause long enough to remember the wisdom we've tucked away for moments just like this. Wisdom from the prophet Fred Rogers, who reminded us that when the waters of fear, uncertainty, and grief begin to rise, we should think about the people who have loved us into being. That English teacher, that basketball coach, that lady Sarah's mom, you know her actual name, that grandparent, that parent, that stand-in who was really always the real thing. Yes, that's how we got here. That's how we made it all the way to 2020. Help us Holy One, in these still early moments of this new year, to bring the best of them with us, grace and grit, humor and resolve, to live as best we can, as they would have us do, as you would have us do. For the year is new, and we have miles to go. We pray in your holy name. Amen. This devotional, written by Max Berman and copyrighted in 1927, first gained national attention when the pastor of Old St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Baltimore, Maryland, included it in a group of devotionals for his church in the late 1950s. Originally one paragraph, it has been split into short stanzas, making it a prose poem. It has inspired many, including people as diverse as former Canadian Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, twice presidential aspirant Adlai Stevenson, and the actor Morgan Freeman, who says it changed his life. Today, Robin has asked me to read it to you in lieu of a traditional scripture. I'm glad to do this for my friend. In my reading, I will be using the pronunciation and the definition provided by Miriam Webster. Desiderata, things desired. Go placidly amid the noise and the haste and remember what peace there may be in silence. As far as possible, without surrender, be on good terms with all persons. Speak your truth quietly and clearly and listen to others, even to the dull and the ignorant, 
they too have their story. Avoid loud and aggressive persons. They are vexatious to the spirit. If you compare yourself with others, you may become vain or bitter, for always there will be greater and lesser persons than yourself. Enjoy your achievements as well as your plans. Keep interested in your own career, however humble, it is a real possession in the changing fortunes of time. Exercise caution in your business affairs, for the world is full of trickery. But let this not blind you to what virtue there is. Many persons strive for high ideals, and everywhere life is full of heroism. Be yourself. Especially do not feign affection. Neither be cynical about love, for in the face of all aridity and disenchantment, it is as perennial as the grass. Take kindly the counsel of the years, gracefully surrendering the things of youth. Nurture strength of spirit to shield you in sudden misfortune. But do not distress yourself with dark imaginings. Many fears are born of fatigue and loneliness. Beyond a wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. You are a child of the universe no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here. And whether or not it is clear to you, no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. Therefore, be at peace with God, whatever you conceive him to be, and whatever your labors and aspirations in the noisy confusion of life Keep peace in your soul. With all its sham, drudgery, and broken dreams, it is still a beautiful world. Be cheerful. Strive to be happy. So ends the reading of Desiderata, Things Desired. Hello, Mayflower. Hello. <laughs> Wow, who knew I could get a crowd like this just by leaving? <laughs> the problem is, what do you do for an encore? That, that's a serious problem. But really, it is time for me to go, and it's time for you all to go on. It's time for one more sermon, one more look at your faces from this pulpit where you have so graciously allowed me to speak my mind for 35 years. I'm not very good at math, but I think that's three and a half decades, which means, of course, that many of us have actually grown up together. It means that I have baptized children that I later married after they grew up, and then I baptized their children. Do you know where you can find that kind of intimacy these days? You cannot. We were all young and crazy once. Now we are old and crazy because this place brings out the good kind of crazy in everyone. So a word to begin. This is not the day on which I had planned to retire. I promised you at the annual meeting that I would stay a few more years, but under the circumstances, this is the best thing for my family and I hope for Mayflower. So the first thing I want to do is apologize to all of you because I had to break that promise. This is a decision that Sean and I have struggled with and argued about and cried about for months. To have to make it fills us with a sadness we cannot begin to express. But it is also an opportunity to leave well, which I have been told by wise people is better than staying too long despite the cost. Therefore, my last word to you this morning is not one of bitterness or regret, but instead it's a song, a song of enormous gratitude for the privilege of leading the most remarkable church I have ever known or will ever know. And just to be clear, you built it. It is not true to say that I built Mayflower Church except as you made possible this free pulpit and then turned me loose to teach and preach and write about church as something other than a Sunday morning ritual of decency. 
you gave me the freedom to mark out this place as distinctly different from the dominant religious culture of Oklahoma, a place where we can follow Jesus, not just worship Christ. You made this church a tenacious collective spirit of compassion and subversive nonconformity. You did that, and that can never be taken away. I was not preaching to myself all those years. I was preaching to you, and you listened, and you acted, and together we have helped to change a small corner of this world and make church a real option for grown-ups again, a place that is biblically responsible, intellectually honest, emotionally satisfying, and socially significant. And kid yourself not, you and your work have inspired more people than you know around the country and even around the world. So the first thing you should do is congratulate yourselves. Then, because this is my last shot, you should indulge the old man in a brief walk down Mayflower's memory lane, okay? Here we go. If I could use only one word to describe the Bible, I know what it would be. Uneven. And if I could use only one word to describe Mayflower, it would be unlikely. How unlikely? Let me count the ways. First, this place was built in the late 50s during the McCarthy era to avoid the problems of the inner city. Get it? And to avoid the communist plot known as the United Church of Christ. That they may all be one. That's the motto of the UCC. And I heard a deacon in a congregational church say to me years ago that they may all be one my ass. <laughs> That's just ecclesiastical Marxism. And there goes the neighborhood. What he was really saying was, may they all be separate, segregated, knowing their place and staying in it because separation is the source of all human sin. You look around in your pew if you're a really inclusive kind of church and suddenly there's a stranger there and you say, who let him in here? Or who let her in here? And the answer, the real answer, is as scary as it is redemptive. God did. So, like all good Sooners who love to get a jump on a piece of the promised land, we staked our plot of ground out here in what was once a wheat field in the middle of nowhere with an unobstructed view of Lake Hefner, and we assumed the world would never catch up with us. The founding minister, of Mayflower was a member of the John Birch Society. He must be turning over in his grave. <laughs> Just to prove that God has a sense of humor, not only can we not see the lake anymore, except if we crawl up on the steeple, but Mayflower is the second largest church in the Kansas-Oklahoma Conference of the dreaded United Church of Christ. It is Oklahoma's first self-declared sanctuary church. It is open and affirming by a unanimous vote 20 years ago, solar-powered, mission-driven, and crawling with people who never thought they would set foot in a church again. Take that, John Birch. <laughs> so let me, tell you a let me tell you a little secret. In 1985, when an interim minister by the name of Charles Whipple called me in my office in Detroit, where I was serving as pastor of Bushnell UCC Church, to ask me if I knew any liberal ministers who might serve Mayflower, because as he put it, Mayflower needs a liberal minister. My first response was, did you say you were calling from Oklahoma? <laughs> as it turned out, nobody was much interested in becoming the pastor here. Early in my tenure, I read the letters from my clergy colleagues each one of them declining to apply for the Mayflower pulpit. And why wouldn't they? This is not exactly the center of the congregational universe, and our attendance in those days on a good Sunday was 60, and our total budget was 93,000. 
with no real mission giving except what the guild, bless their hearts, was able to do by raising funds at a fall rummage sale and a spring style show. I came home from work in Detroit that day and told Sean that there was a church in Oklahoma looking for a liberal pastor, and she thought it was the first line of a joke. <laughs> Wait a minute, wait a minute, Sean. I said, I'm an Okie. Remember, don't forget. Born in St. Anthony's Hospital. And by the way, as it turns out, delivered by a young medical intern on duty that day named Jim Bell. Joanne Bell's late husband. We looked this up on my birth certificate. So you talk about a small world. Just think about it. A baby he delivered ended up leading him through the vows of marriage, and if he'd known, he could have slapped me on the bottom and said, that's my pastor. <laughs> but I digress. It seldom happens. Confession. Sean and I grew up in Kansas, and when she thought about moving to Oklahoma, she said, nope, no way not moving any place where the dirt is red. We moved to Oklahoma City six months later. We brought our two young children, Blue seven and Chelsea four, to a rental house while we looked for a home to buy near the church. The problem was we had no money to put down on a house. We wanted to live in our own home, not a parsonage. So when the trustees turned down my request to loan us down payment money, at no interest, which we would repay from automatic deductions from my salary, a trustee actually said, I wouldn't loan money to my own children at no interest. <laughs> Whew. <laughs> well, Dr. Larry Stream came to the rescue, the late father of our own Larry Stream, circle, circle, circle. He called me to say that he would loan us the, the money for a down payment at no interest, and then he wrote out an amortization schedule by hand on a legal pad, and we paid him $100 a month for 200 months. So we have Dr. Stream to thank for owning a home where we have lived ever since, just three blocks from here. To say my first seven years at Mayflower were difficult would be an understatement. My theological liberalism was not the problem, it was my obvious and outspoken refusal to think of Ronald Reagan as God. <laughs> First of all, I just didn't think God would refuse to say the word AIDS for five years after the outbreak of that terrible disease, or call single mothers welfare queens. But some Mayflower folk wondered what on earth they had done. Sean and I wondered exactly the same thing. And we actively looked elsewhere to get us out of this place, and we came within a whisker of moving to Massachusetts. Then a series of events took place that now seem miraculous to me. First, we thought we were done having children, and then Cass came along, and Mayflower greeted his arrival with a special affection. When I baptized him, the sermon was based on a Paul Simon song called Born at the Right Time. Our oldest child, Blue, is a corporate pilot, a captain who's responsible for the lives of other very important people and operates a tremendously sophisticated piece of equipment. But when he was a young boy, he broke everything he touched. <laughs> and so God said, I will make him a pilot. <laughs> he and his wife, Melissa, are the parents of the even more remarkable Iris, a girl who thinks there's nothing girls can't do. Our daughter Chelsea worked at OCU and then married Jason Ewald, who actually asked Blue with whom he worked if it was okay if he called to ask his sister out for a date. And now they're the parents of two remarkable girls, Hazel, a quiet genius, and Eleonora, who is trouble waiting to happen disguised as adorable. <laughs> So, just to be clear, my tenure at Mayflower has not always been smooth, 
but nobody who's ever met my family or the amazing mother of my children and not understood that our real legacy is not going to be any particular sermon or a stormy annual meeting or even a memorable funeral, but rather the amazing human beings who grew up three blocks from here and are making the world a better place every single day. So all glory, laud, and honor be to Sean. Okay. Enough, enough embarrassing the family, back to the miracles. The phone rang one day, a man named Bob Barr said, Robin, you're saying some pretty crazy stuff in the pulpit, but I think more people need to hear it. So I would like to finance a year's worth of 30 minute Sunday morning radio broadcasts, to which he then added in his iconoclastic way, why just piss off your congregation? <laughs> when you can piss off people riding in their cars. I thought to myself, this is a solid idea. So Mayflower contracted to have the first ever religious broadcast on KTOK, the AM radio home of Rush Limbaugh and Michael Savage, and squeezed in between them, Robin Myers. <laughs> to put it mildly, people heard things they were not prepared to hear. And then I heard about it. We called the program A Second Opinion on Christianity, and it was produced by the late Dave Rucker, a radio guy who donated his time and effort as his contribution to the church. I do remember one phone call late one night from a long haul truck driver on a lonely stretch of road in eastern New Mexico who asked if I was that preacher and then said, boy, what the hell do you think you're doing to Jesus? This program ran for many years, and people who ended up coming to Mayflower told me they would often listen to it on the way to their church, as if we were having a kind of clandestine radio affair. <laughs> then Pam Fleischaker asked me if I would take her regular commentary slot at the Oklahoma Gazette. And for 10 years, I wrote over 100 editorials and set a record for most angry letters to the editor. <laughs> Between those radio broadcasts and those newspaper columns, Mayflower's light had been taken out from underneath the bushel basket. So many people came over from Church of the Servant that Rabbi Pacman referred to Mayflower as Church of the Servant East. <laughs> but this was hardly the end of the miraculous happenings. After preaching a sermon called Deep Water, about Jesus telling his disciples to lower their nets in a different spot, after which, of course, they hauled up more fish than they could handle. A then much younger Mark Falk said to me in the line after church, Robin, I know where we can find some deep water. And so the Mayflower Medical Outreach was born. And on our first trip in 1999, something hilarious happened. I was giving eye exams, because I'm, you know, qualified. <laughs> but, you know, just use your hand to indicate the direction of the E, that kind of thing. We, we, I don't speak Spanish, so we tacked the eye chart on a tree, and I learned my one line, Usa la mano para indicar la dirección de la E. Use your hand to indicate the direction of the E. There was just one problem. I was saying, Usa la mano, not mano, and mono means monkey. <laughs> so I was asking those patients, most of them men, to use their monkey <laughs> to indicate the direction of the E. I could not figure out why I was getting such strange looks, <laughs> even to the point of gringo go home. <laughs> so on the plane ride back from Managua, I wrote a sermon called Monkeys for Peace. And the amazing, life-changing Mayflower Medical Outreach and its ministry to the deaf and hearing impaired in Nicaragua continues to this day. The 363 mission was already up and running when a Mayflower member named, J named Jim Lookabaugh, with help from Glenda Stansbury, among others, started feeding homeless people in a park south of the river. Now, over two decades later, that machine of compassion that is 363 cranks on, 
feeding 500 to 600 homeless clients a month and providing them with items needed for human dignity. Mostly using money that 363 folk take from their own pockets. We have fed them, given them gifts, given them smiles, and never ever tried to convert a single one of them to our version of Christianity. Mobile meals, whiz kids, voice, the list goes on, but you know this already. A woman who belongs to a large conservative church in Edmond said once about Mayflower, I'm not sure about their theology, but that church has a big, big heart. To which I responded, that is our theology. To close, let me say that it is impossible for me to know how to end this sermon because with every fiber of my being, I don't want it to end. There is, of course, the professor in me that says, do the review, Robin. Tell them one more time all the things you believe. Leave them with something ringing in their ears as if they don't know it already after 35 years. But please, would you please carry on this work? Be the kind of church that knows that Jesus is the most important and the most misunderstood figure in human history. That black lives matter. That daughters are as important as sons. That gay people are not freaks of nature but constituents of creation. That faith is about what you do, not about what you believe. That forgiveness is the most godlike thing you will ever do. That narcissism is the anti-gospel. That kids are not little versions of you. That Sunday morning only matters if it changes Monday through Saturday. That the things Jesus taught us about God are so much more important than the things the church has taught us about Jesus. That compassion is never to be confused with purity that slavery and white privilege are America's original sin, that more guns don't make us safer, that money does not trickle down, and that the marketplace cannot solve all the problems of life. Only the common good can do that. Whoops, this is sounding like a review. <laughs> but I can't help myself. We're, we're, we're about to go to war. But war is over if you want it. And God does not have chosen people because either all of us matter or none of us do. Most of all, please, please, please imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. I am not retiring from ministry but from employment as a minister of this church. We will continue to cherish and to support the work that is done here. And as you surely know, we will find other ways to serve. There's a quote by Joseph Campbell that suddenly seemed luminous to me. He said, we must be willing to get rid of the life we've planned so as to have the life that is waiting for us. It is my fervent prayer that whatever comes next will be full and gracious and fearless. And please know that we will never, ever, ever forget you or the life you've made possible for us. I cannot think of a better way to have spent the last 35 years or better people to have spent them with or a better church to remember and to be proud of than the good ship Mayflower. So I want to say three things before stepping down. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you. Amen.